deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the third episode of Who's God? It's the FBN series in which we contrast and compare the Hebrew Torah deity Yahweh with our Christian God as revealed to us only through Jesus Christ. Now, today we're going to be taking a look at the famous Battle of the Hebrew War Gods as we read about it in 2 Kings 3.26. And by the way, these episodes seem to have struck a chord with many people who have described a lifelong struggle with an inability to reconcile the barbaric acts of the people and deity described in the Torah, which, of course, was later renamed to the Old Testament and stapled onto the Christian Bible. It's a lifelong struggle to make that carnal deity and human sacrifice culture fit within the framework of Christianity. And if this problem has happened to you, don't be alarmed. It just means your brain is still working. Unfortunately, though, what usually happens is that people decide, well, this is nonsense, and there's no home for me in this confusing and convoluted Judeo-Christian religion, and they just wander off and become agnostics, atheists, or double down and join some weird Jim Jones cult. Some will even stay in the religion without believing it and just kind of go through the motions in a half-hearted effort to appease family and friends. You see, we all have a connection to God and we want to nurture it, but when the path appears to be blocked, many people just give up. Now, if you're one of those people that I just described, the solution is very simple, and you'll find it in the form of the very first Christian Bible of 144 AD. And the first thing you'll notice is that the Torah or Old Testament hasn't been stapled to it like we find in today's Judeo-Christian Bible. You see, the original contains just the Gospel of the Lord and the Apostle Paul's original ten epistles. It's not very complicated at all, so if you're looking for a Jim Jones or Mormon cult, sorry, this isn't it. Now, you'll also be glad to know that there are pre-Nicene churches, including the Marcionite Christian Church, that exist today, and they use that original Bible, even thriving with the online communities to help you reconnect. See how easy that was? Which brings us to today's episode. The Who's God series is for people who have entered into the theological Stockholm Syndrome phase, and in many cases are too far gone to help after a lifetime diet of false doctrine spoon-fed since birth. But sometimes a lost sheep is found, and it's on those occasions that we celebrate. And in that continuing effort, we use examples, citing word for word, no tricks, right from the Torah Old Testament, and then contrast and compare those examples with the teachings of Christ. Now, in our first two episodes, we talked about Jacob winning a wrestling match against Yahweh, followed by the Jephthah story in Judges, in which he murders and sets on fire his daughter in a human sacrifice ritual to thank Yahweh for helping him win a battle against a rival Hebrew tribe. And by the way, at the end, it was revealed that both of those stories actually had their roots in Greek mythology and were simply plagiarized fairy tales refashioned by the Hebrews to fit their own fables. I'll have links in the show notes so you can check those out. But today, we're going to deconstruct 2 Kings 3.26-27. It's the story of three kings, and where have we heard this before? Three Jewish kings, though, this time, who band together. The kings of the Israelites, Edomites, and the Judahites, they banded together in much the same style we described as biker gangs in our last episode, banded together to beat payment out of a rival gang called the Moabites uh, and their leader, Mesha, that owed one of them 100,000 sheep. Now, this Mesha was on the hook to the king of Israel for 100,000 sheep payable every year, and he finally said no. Now, you've heard stories of how the mafia collects on protection money. Well, same thing here, except a lot of sheep. And this guy didn't pay up. 
Basically, what we're talking about here is the Hebrew Mafia. Hey, Tone, we have a little problem over here on Moab Street. What kind of problem? It's this Mesha guy. He won't give up the sheep. Says he won't pay. Oh, he won't pay? How many sheep are we talking about? Don't. A hundred thousand. But instead of breaking a kneecap, they were going to murder everyone in the kingdom of Moab, including women and children. And there's nothing new about that because they do it a lot throughout the Torah Old Testament. Nothing personal, it's just business. Oh, sorry to interrupt the story here, but if you have some idea as to what absolutely any of this has to do with Christianity, please let us know in the comments section, because I'm not seeing it. I don't get it. It's almost like, oh, I don't know, almost like two different religions were stapled together or something. So weird. And remember, this is all supposed to be the Word of God. Who's God? You tell me. Seriously. All right, let's get back to our story. Now, the easy thing to do would be to just ride off with our three Jewish kings and get right to what happens when they went to collect their bill from Mesha and the Moabites. But I think a little context is in order here, don't you? The first thing you have to understand is that all these tribes or biker gangs were all related all from the same ethnic stock, lineage, and genealogy. At one time or another, they were all fighting and killing each other and marrying each other and doing human sacrifices to each other. Six of one, half dozen of the other. Not a dime's worth of difference between them all. In fact, some of the most vicious fighting and barbaric acts would be committed between the Judahites and the Edomites, the very same two kings riding together now in this story. And the Moabites that they're about to attack? Yeah, all related. Now this bunch was from Lot's line. In fact, it's from the Moabites that the famous King David would find one of his parents. And you can read all about that in their Book of Ruth if you're interested. And at the end of the day, the whole thing reads like a Hollywood script, except, if you can believe it, even more depraved, violent, and debased than any movie. And it wasn't just the inbreeding, death, destruction, and human sacrifices that they shared. And this, in a roundabout way, brings us back to our story. You see, the most important thing they all shared were their gods. Not God singular. Gods, as in plural. In fact, each one of these Hebrew tribes or gangs had their own god. Some even had more than one god. Now, Yahweh is the one that became the most famous after being stapled onto your Bible at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, but he was just one of a dozen that the Jews worshipped at one time or another. They included Baal, Molech, Chemosh, Ashtaroth, Asherah, Zebub, Dagon, and Marduk, just to name a few. You see, the Hebrews were monolatrous. That's a $5 word for people who believe many gods exist, but that their god is the most powerful. Now, that becomes clear when you read their first commandment that they say Yahweh gave them. Quote, Thou shalt have no other, wait for it, gods before me, unquote. In other words, recognizing multiple gods exist. The commandment doesn't say, I am the only God. The only question these gangs had was, who had the most powerful God? And doing battle with each other was one way to prove who was right about their God's power. And on the fight card today, we have Yahweh representing three different Jewish kings versus Chemosh fighting out of the blue corner for Mesha and the Moabites. Now, as we go through the rest of this story, it's important to keep in mind that King Solomon, the famous Jewish king, would later erect an altar to Chemosh, and the Hebrews would do child sacrifices to this deity for centuries, right there in Jerusalem. And it's all dutifully documented in 1 Kings 11.7, 2 Kings 23.10, and Jeremiah 32.35. Like I said, six of one, half dozen of the other. All right, let's mount up. Let's ride on over to the Moab spread before these kings start killing each other again. Okay, now this part of the story is going to get a little bit weird. We've been riding for seven days now in the Edomite desert with the king of the Edomites as a traveling companion to guide us. But 
I guess they got lost anyway or something. In any event, they all run out of water. All three armies and the kings are just plumb out of water. And this next part is also a little bit hard to follow, but it involves a prophet with an attitude problem and somebody playing a harp. Long story short, Yahweh instructs them to dig ditches, which are then magically filled with water at some point, and Yahweh also promises them victory over the Moabites in the coming battle. Now, with this turn of events, things are looking up for the three amigos, and the battle begins. Yahweh and his posse look to have victory in the bag, but then something unexpected happens. We'll pick up the action at 2 Kings 3.26, and I quote, When the king of Moab realized he was losing the battle, he and 700 swordsmen tried to break through and attack the king of Edom, but they failed. So he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king, and offered him up as a burnt sacrifice on the wall. There was an outburst of divine anger against Israel, so they broke off the attack and returned to their homeland." Unquote. Did you hear that? Now, once again, I'm asking for your help. On which planet exactly does this have anything to do with Christianity, from the people, the culture, their gods, their motivations, anything, anybody. Here, let's read it again. So he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king, and offered him up as a burnt sacrifice on the wall. There was an outburst of divine anger against Israel, so they broke off the attack and returned to their homeland. Did you hear what I said? You know, I'm starting to think that the devil's greatest trick was stapling his Bible to yours. Come to think of it, 75% of it has nothing to do with Christianity, and only 2% of the words in it are actually purported to be the words spoken by Jesus. In any event, these last two sentences present a serious problem for Judeo-Christians and their apologetics industry. Let's start with some basic questions. To which Hebrew war god did Mesha sacrifice his firstborn son and secure his victory over the Israelites? Well, if it was Chemosh, that means Yahweh is not omnipotent, and he was defeated. It also highlights the Jewish belief of multiple gods. And we're reminded of the tiny detail that we as Christians only believe there is one God. So we have a lot of problems here. Now, what's the other option? Well, in our last Who's God episode, we discovered that Jephthah, uh, another Israelite king in Judges 11.30-39, through 39, murdered and sacrificed his only daughter to Yahweh as tribute to him after defeating the Ammonites. Now, did Mesha just do the same thing and sacrifice his child to Yahweh also as a way to secure victory? After all, Chemosh hadn't done him any good, and he was on the brink of total defeat. Did he play the Yahweh card at the last minute? I mean, all the other Hebrews were doing human sacrifices to Yahweh. Maybe it would work. And let's face it, he was out of options. And lo and behold, he wins the battle as payment for murdering his firstborn son. Now remember, these are the only two options, and neither one is compatible with the belief system of Christianity. That dog won't hunt. Now, the next sentence is even more problematic by several orders of magnitude. Let's read it together. Quote, There was an outburst of divine anger against Israel, so they broke off the attack and returned to their homeland. Unquote. Did you hear what I said? What? Divine anger from which Hebrew war god? Again, we have the same set of inescapable options. Let's run through them. If Chemosh was the source of the divine anger which scattered the Israelites after they were promised victory by Yahweh, that means, again, Yahweh is not omnipotent, and there are multiple gods, and again, 100% incompatible with Christianity. Let's look at the other option. If Yahweh was the source of the divine anger, what would cause him to suddenly, inexplicably, save the Moabites and defeat his own people, the same people he just got done promising victory to? What would cause him to do that? Well, guess what? There's only one event that precedes it as a reason, and that is Mesh's murder and burnt offering of his firstborn son. 
And that makes it a de facto Yahweh death cult, plain and simple, no different than the Aztecs. Now, you can dance on the head of a pin and troll magic chickens over your head until the cows come home, but it won't change anything. This story and verse, word of somebody's God or not, 100% ends any relationship, real or imagined, that Judaizers claim exists between Judaism and Christianity. So, which brings us to the question, was Yahweh actually Satan or just one of many other lesser demons that we read about in the Torah Old Testament? A jealous demon constantly having to look over his shoulder to make sure Baal, Molech, Chemosh, Ashtoreth, Asherah, Zebub, Adagog, and Marduk weren't trying to steal his cult members. Is that why his very first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me? One continues to wonder if the devil's greatest trick was actually stapling his religion to yours. These are good questions for a different episode, perhaps. Anyway, as Christians, it's enough for us to know that we don't want to have anything to do with this Yahweh death cult and its wandering biker gang mafia. Just as we don't immerse ourselves in the Koran or Hinduism, it's not our religion, not our book, not our God. We have our own God as revealed to us only through Jesus Christ. And we have our own Bible, the first Christian Bible, just as it was in 144 AD, unchanged and unedited ever since then. And you can get a free copy of that pre-Nicene Bible at theveryfirstbible.org.org. Now, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that we live in some extremely strange times right now. And one of the most important shields you can have against the deceptions, delusions, and inversions of reality is the firm, unshifting theological bedrock of pre-Nicene Christianity. That and your first Bible with its original canon. Because with it, you can not be deceived by the Judaizers. Just as we read it in 1 Corinthians 14.23, quote, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, unquote. That's a wrap for today, I think, and it's a pretty good note to end things on. Now, we of course hope you're enjoying these Who's God episodes, and you'll notice that there's no ads or pleas for donations, no begging, uh, nor have there ever been for the years that we've been broadcasting on the First Bible Network, because... It's been your prayers that have ensured God's Holy Spirit attends to our needs, and we thank you for those prayers. And lastly, on a housekeeping note, the domain name prenicene.org has been acquired by the Marcionite Church and is quickly becoming a repository for resources, links, media, and information related to the pre-Nicene era. I encourage you to check that out. Uh, it has resources that can benefit you immediately, today. So just uh, when you go there, make sure you put a dash between pre and Nicene, just like it's spelled. Thanks for joining us. I'm Darren Kalama with FBN, and we'll see you next time. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either. And that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. Ten books and the Gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.